We picked up and signed for our new planes and were then scheduled to take the southern route to the European Theater of Operations. On uh, January the 1st of 1943, we took off from Morrison Field uh, in West Palm Beach on an itinerary that would have been a veritable tourist dream. I would hate to have to pay for it in today's dollars. Our first destination was Brinkin Field in Puerto Rico, but two of our crews managed to get into a weather front with uh, vicious up and down drafts. One of the most terrifying experiences of my entire life, which depleted our fuel supply and compelled us to land on Hispaniola, now known as the Dominican Republic, at the city of Ciudad Trujillo, its capital. We had to stay there several days so that they could cut down trees to lengthen the runway to enable us to take off. And I can tell you that uh, Ciudad Trujillo, now known as Santo Domingo, was really a beautiful place with a great deal of Colombian history. Our next destination was the island of Trinidad. It too was a tropical paradise. Next was our flight to South America. We had some inexperienced navigators who were getting their first on-the-job training and uh, while our destination was Belen de Paraná, at the mouth of the Amazon River in Brazil, somehow our navigators managed to lead us to the coast of Venezuela. <laughs> Fortunately, uh, we could navigate visually by following the coastline of Belen. We first stopped at Georgetown, British Guiana, and then to Belen. And from Belen to uh, Natal, which is on the easternmost point of Brazil. And after a few days there, we took off at a lumbering, fuel-conserving pace across the Atlantic Ocean at about 160 miles per hour. We finally made it to our next destination, Ascension Island, where they had to shoo away the seagulls, what they called wide-awake birds, from the runway before we were cleared to land. Next was a crop on the Gold Coast of Africa. And uh, then to Monrovia, Liberia, to uh, Bathurst, and then to Gambia, places that were previously completely unknown to us. At Bathurst, the field was located on the banks of a river, and that night we could see the fires and hear the tom-toms across the river beating out jungle rhythms. And the war was farthest from our minds at that time. The next leg of our journey took us over a fascinating course. We could not go to Dakar and Senegal, which, which would have been the next logical place, uh, because the Germans were still there. They still occupied Senegal. So we flew across the Atlas Mountains and the Sahara Desert, and a beautiful green valley in which lay Marrakesh, one of the ancient capitals of the Moorish Empire. Replete with its mysterious Kasbah, a beautiful Moorish temple called the Kutubia, and a magnificent hotel, the Hotel de la Mamunya to Marrakesh. We were billeted there in the Mamunya, and I was in a large and luxurious room facing the formal guards at the rear of the hotel. One evening, another pal and I went to dinner in the hotel's exquisite marble dining room. And shortly after, a striking black woman in a white turban and figure clinging gown came in the, on the arm of the Paja of Marrakesh, El Glui, who was its mayor, and she was just simply ravishing. We decided to go over and ask her to sign our short snorters. And the short snorter was made up of bills from the various countries that we had gone. We taped them together as a memento. Well, we walked over to her table, and I remember asking her in broken French if she would please uh, autograph our bills. And she replied, flashing a sparkling smile, 
I would be delighted to, boys. It was Josephine Baker. And I still have that shorts in order. Why did I leave it at home? To, to prove er everything I've said here is not all made up. Uh, the next night, General George Patton came in sporting his twin pearl handled revolvers and riding boots, and he strode into the dining room while at the same time his first armored division was being ambushed and decimated in the Kasserine Pass. And coincidentally, just a week ago, some fellow from Marietta called me. And he was in that first armored division and was captured there at the Catherine Pass. And later, uh, I think, confined to, to an enlisted camp in Germany. Well, we spent two delightful weeks in Marrakesh. Uh, our next step was Port Leone on the Atlantic coast, one of the Allied invasion points. And after about a week there, we received orders to fly to Barry St. Edmunds in England via Tor Torquay on the southwestern tip of, of uh, the island. Once more, our navigators almost sent us off course to the coast of German-occupied Normandy. Fortunately, one of our pilots realized the obvious error and we arrived without mishap at Barry. It was located about 75 miles northeast of London and about 40 miles from the North Sea. And there, our bomber command decided that we should be employed in low-level bombing at treetop level. And the next couple of months were spent learning to fly in ways in which air cadets in flying school would have been washed out. The B-26s were skidded, pulled up, pushed down, and almost torn apart. And this was evasive action in order to avoid being tracked, as you do when you're tracking those birds. Finally, on May the 14th of uh, 1943, the first bombing mission took place. And this was the first bombing mission by the medium of bombardment groups in England. And on that date, the fun and games ended. And they ended with a crash of one of our pilots battered plane over the field at Perry, containing his body. He had stuck with the ship in order to allow his crew to bail out, but he failed to make it himself. Our euphoria ended with a severely injured Roland Scott, who was a brother of General Scott there in Lord Robbins. Uh, his eye was shot out and half of his face was gone. And I suppose that that day really marked the end of youth for all of us because we were never the same again. Three days later, May the 17th, 1943, the other half of our group and half of a companion group were alerted for the second flight to Holland. And this time the target was a power plant in Harlem, Holland. So we were not briefed very well. And on that particular flight, our group commander, Colonel Stillman, led the group and his executive officer led my flight. In any event, we were flying as low as we could, could uh, over the North Sea to avoid detection by German radar. And I've often fibbed a little in describing the flight by saying that we were flying so low that we could see the wake from the prop wash of the plane ahead of us. Two-thirds of the way across the North Sea to the coast of Holland, one of our pilots pulled up to what I estimated to be a thousand field, feet and aborted. And we later felt that his doing so alerted the German radar because when we crossed the Dutch coast, we were met with a solid wall of small arms fire. 